All right, well, thanks for coming out. We are in Daniel chapter 8. We're going to finish that up. We're going to move into chapter 9 today as well. Um, I will also give you a chance to ask any question there in chapter 8. Um, so we kind of do like a little summary review of the whole chapter today as well. I think that would be kind of neat. Um, Why well, I gave you these, if you want to um, add some things as we go to chapter 9, you can certainly do that that um, if you're using those um, I give you the key words for the chapter and verses and and those things that tie into that as well um, all right last week we kind of were talking about verse 8 in chapter 8 specifically um, then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly but as soon as he was mighty the large horn was broken and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four <coughs> winds of heaven. And these are who? These are the um, captains. These are the generals of Alexander the Great, which happened 22 years later, you know, as they come to power and power struggles happen and those things. Um, and verse 9, out of them came a fourth and came, came forth a <laughs> yeah came forth <laughs> came forth uh, came forth a ruler a small horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south toward the east and toward the beautiful land and he did and um, he he grew powerful and this is who do you remember type of the Antichrist yes Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, and he grew powerful. Now, um, Ptolemy, or Ptolemy, as I like to call him, because it begins with a P, um, was one of the ones who reigned in Egypt. Well, Antiochus kind of reigned um, not in Egypt, but Rome was beginning to um, become a power then as well. And he went down and was thinking about conquering um, um, Antiochus was, began to think about conquering Egypt. And there was a guy by the name of Popphilius. And Popphilius is a Greek word and it means fat belly. And he kind of was, he kind of was. He was, a, he was a Roman, but he was a really plump guy. And when Antiochus Epiphanes came down to conquer Egypt, um, he had all of his armies behind him, dressed in his general suit. This is like a famous incident in history. And um, Popphilius, he, he comes out, and um, he's just dressed in his, um, he, he, like a politician, if you would. <laughs> and that's what he was. He was a representative. And he only had a few men behind him. But he came out and said to Antiochus Epiphanes, he said, if you attack... Egypt here, we will bring, you will be attacking um, Rome and you will be dealt with. Um, well, Antiochus was really debating, you know, what he was going to do at this point in time in history. And um, Antiochus was like, well, I tell you what, um, I'm going to go think about this and I'll return and let you know my decision. Well, the, the little fat belly guy, what he did, he took a marker, a stick, and he drew a circle right around Antiochus Epiphanes. This is where we get the expression, the, the red line or the line in the sand. Um, that's where this came from. He drew a line and he said, if you leave here without giving me your answer, and he said this right in front of all of his army, um, he said, that will be a declaration of war. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, now, Antiochus Epiphanes was just humiliated, absolutely humiliated. He had the army there, but he knew to declare war against, you know, the generals always fought and things, and he did not um, want to fight um, all of them. And he knew that, yeah, I might get Egypt, I'm going to be attacked. So he, he thought about it, and he went away mad and furious and humiliated. And as it says there in verse 9, um, toward the beautiful land, after leaving Egypt, um, on his way back, there was the area of Jerusalem. 
He stops there with his army, and that began the horror stories upon the Jews because he is furious, right? He didn't get what he wanted, and now he's going to take it out on God's people. Now, remember, as we went through last week, I, we, we talked about um, the things that he, he has done. Um, and, you know, it, it says there, um, verse, 13, verse 12, And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. He changed the holy name of God, Yahweh, to Zeus, Zeus Olympus. Remember the Colosseum um, that I was telling you about. Um, he sacrificed pigs on the altar. Um, he prohibited things like the Sabbath, Jewish festivals, uh, circumcision. We talked about that. Um, he also um, plundered the temple treasury. So he's just desecrating the Jews. He's, he's literally uh, trying to wipe them out. Um, so that's, that's what he did. Now, what's interesting from this aspect, there were, there were some Jews that supported him, you know, and he placed Jason as a high priest. Remember that? Uh, from the book of Maccabees. We, we read extensively last week. Um, there was, there was actually two groups that they call like proto-groups proto that came out of this era. Um, the one was the proto-Sadducees. Um, um, they, they were the ones who became in the New Testament more in line with the Sadducees. And it was also, they were very much for Antiochus Epiphanes and becoming Hellenized, if you would, um, with Greek culture. The other group, the proto-Pharisees, they were very much against this and revolted against this. So kind of interesting, the division there of the Jews. Um, so, um, and I, I say that because, um, where does it say this here? Um, in verse 24, his power will be mighty, but not his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and holy people. Um, you know, and that could describe their two groups of Jews, um, or it could even describe um, other countries. So I just bring that up for, for some of your, your thinking there. So with all that being said, um, in verse 24, it does say what? That his, his power, um, going back to verse uh, 24, let me turn to the right chapter. His power will be mighty, but not his own power. What do you think that means there? Um, it means that he's going to be energized by Satan. He's going to be this one who is, is, is certainly um, uh, controlled by him. Just like, now remember, he's a type of Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes was not the Antichrist. He's a type. Um, but look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. And it says there in verse 2, And the beast which I saw, was like a leopard, and his feet were those like a bear, and his mouth like that of a lion. Ah, what? He's kind of embracing all those aspects of Gentile world powers, right? Um, do you see how he kind of embodies all of that? Really neat when you think about that. This beast is the Antichrist. And it says, and the dragon gave him what? His power. Oh, Satan now working with the beast who's described as the Antichrist, um, and his throne, and great authority. So certainly energized by Satan, and fused by Satan. Um, and verse 24 says, um, he will prosper, he will continue, he will destroy, right? He will destroy the mighty 
and the holy people. And then verse 25, and this is through his, um, not just through his military might in those things, but through his policies that he institutes. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit um, to succeed by his influence. <laughs> we see that happen a lot today anymore, right? Um, a lot of deceit for people to get ahead, right? Um, and that's exactly what he will do. Um, now, where does he arise from? He arises from what we might call the United States of Europe, right? Or the revived Roman Empire. Now, you know, just thinking about what's happening today, right? With the invasion there in the Ukraine by, by Putin, as you think about that, um, and as I said last couple weeks, he, what Putin has done in unifying them, no other person has done in history that they are so united right now and standing against um, Putin. And, you know, Europe is going to become a, a powerhouse militarily, right? And why won't they? They're going to have Russia right on its borders without even a buffer state there of of the Ukraine. You can see this happening and unfolding right before our eyes. This is this is pretty exciting times, right? This isn't going to be like America just defends Europe. Europe will become powerful, right? And it, it's kind of neat. Could this be setting it up for, for final world stage events? It certainly does appear to be that way, right? Um, with the oil, I mentioned that as before we began, protect the oil and the wine, that phrase there in Revelation. Um, so yeah, the source of energy of the future is not going to be, we're not gonna be going on another um, million, billion years here on earth, right? And everything's gonna get green and fresh and clean. Um, it's not, it's, things are, you know, um, even all the push for, for um, clean energy, it just doesn't happen. Oil becomes and still is the major source of energy, right? And that's what frustrates us right now as Americans paying high, pa high price on gas, right? We know the engine uh, of America is oil, right? It's, it's just, now it's great to try to balance that. It's great to try to clean the earth, but just realize from a Christian standpoint, Oil is still important in the end. Um, and realize also that what we're seeing now with the strengthening of the revived Roman Empire, the European areas over there, um, that they will boil down once again to a 10-nation confederacy, right? And from that, the Antichrist will uproot three of them, assume greater power, and kind of lead them as one leader, um, which they don't have right now, do they? They don't have one voice yet. That's why you see Germany speaking. That's why you see all these ones. But when the Antichrist takes the scene, he will speak for them all. You know, they will be there, but he is the voice of the United um, Roman European um, area. So, um, so here's his policy. Let's go back to that. And through his shrewdness, verse 25, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. That's one of the things that he, he does. He goes out and he destroys. So we talked about that. We talked about the time frame of that last week. Um, and verse 26, we, we go to that now. The vision of the evenings and mornings, which um, has been told, is true. But, the vi but keep the vision secret. Now, that's a bad translation there. And King James follows foot with that as well. Um, King James says, shut up, right? Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're bad translations. It doesn't mean to keep it a secret. It means to preserve it, to seal it um, for a later time. It does not mean to keep this a secret. It does, that's, that's not. That's not a good translation. Um, for it pertains. It, and there's the idea. For it pertains to many days in the future. Um, doesn't mean you know. Hey, keep this. This is hidden stuff. Um, it's not. Um, he meant be careful to preserve this 
for the future. Um, and because these things were what? Still yet to come. We know that from chapter 8, verse 1, and the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king, right? So, um, and then he says, at this point, the revelation ended. So right after he gets his words to seal, to seal this up. Um, and he says, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew what? Pale. And he says, I kept the matter to myself. Um, so really what happened after Daniel receives this, um, whoops, let me go back to chapter, chapter 8 there. Um, I, was, I was reading some of the wrong stuff there. Chapter 8, um, the vision, um, then I, Daniel, verse 27, was exhausted and sick for days. Now that does sound like chapter 7 there at the end as well, um, when he received that revelation. But this one, really affected him, and he says he was sick for days. Um, <clears throat> let's just stop there for a moment and, and think about what Daniel was doing. He receives this revelation. It, it's a tremendous amount of information for him. Um, it's about kingdoms yet to come. And when he hears all this, kind of for... It, not the first time because they piggyback off the other visions, right? Um, but when he absorbs all of it, he's just sick to his stomach. Have we ever got to a point with God's word that we read it and we look at the world situation or we look at ourselves and we just become sick of ourselves? That's a good question, isn't it? A good application. Daniel did that. I mean, he, he takes this all in um, and, and it literally made him sick. He says, then I got up again and carried on the king's business, meaning I had to get back to work. I was sick though for days after this vision. Um, he says, but I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. So he kept pondering these things and pondering these things in his mind. Well, that kind of ends chapter 8. I give you a chance, as I said, to ask any question there in chapter 8 that you might have. And I try my best to give an answer of what's happening there in, in the, the context of this. Anything you see there that you want to discuss? This is a, a close-up snapshot, remember, of, of Alexander the Great, his generals, and then the, the general Antiochus Epiphanes that really came and smashed the beautiful land. Um, and, and from that, all of that is still yet, what, future, right? All of it's still yet future. Um, and we know that History has already confirmed to us, the, other than what Daniel said too in explaining the, um, the, the vision, the angel that did that, Gabriel, remember that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very close up view of what's gonna, what happened to Israel and um, it typifies what the Antichrist will be like and will finally do to Israel. But any question that you have, anything you want um, me to go over, give you a minute to think about that. A lot to digest there in that chapter. Okay, moving on then to chapter 9. Good. Um, chapter 9, if you're looking for a theme for this chapter, it is this. Prayer and prophecy. If you want to rhyme it with peace. Um, or if you don't, um, maybe call it prayer and its answer. 
prayer and its answer. Because um, both of those are, are, tr are very true. At the end of this chapter, we still have yet to see the most amazing prophecy that yet takes place in Scripture. Um, so, so this is so, so unique. Um, so, but chapter 9 um, is going to model for us what prayer really is. And, and a lot of people miss that. They'd like to jump to the main prophecy at the end, um, get the, the whole meaning out of all that, and that's great to do. But chapter 9 is really um, about a model prayer. Um, we remember that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, right? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Um, you know, so there we have the steps, if you would. Um, but this chapter doesn't teach us about prayer precept by precept. But what it does, it teaches us prayer by letting us observe it. So we're going to observe Daniel's prayer. Um, and it's, it's going to um, model, really... And, and, and a lot of things that are said in this, you could, you could take it to the Lord's Prayer and say, ah, oh, there's, there's that principle in there. There's this principle. You can do that. You can take Psalm 119 and take another prayer section and model it right back into this. So it's, it's really cool like that. Um, so Daniel, as we already mentioned before, Daniel has been remarkable all through his life, hasn't he? Um, and, and beginning in chapter 2, not accepting the king's meat, um, all through the visions, all through standing up to Belshazzar. Um, and this is going to open in a different time frame than chapter 8. You're going to see it right there in the first year of Darius. Um, chapter 8, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. Um, so, and then... In chapter 7, in the first year of Belshazzar. So, you know, Daniel is keeping very close record of everything here. The visions are that he's recording for us. Um, he's painstakingly dating and giving the details of them under inspiration to us. Um, but Daniel's character, he never, he never bowed the knee to Nebuchadnezzar, right? He didn't bow down. Um, and he didn't stop praying um, over in chapter 6 when he was thrown into the lion's den, right? And he was thrown into the lion's den over in chapter 6. Let's just go there. Remember, that was more of the historical sections. Um, and chapter 6 says, it seemed good to Darius. Now, and when we come over to chapter 9, in the first year of Darius. So... Um, when do the events of chapter 9 take place? Um, in the historical section, right after the Babylonian reign, when we are entering the reign of the Medes and the Persians, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Um, and Daniel, why was he thrown into the lion's den? Because he opened up the lattice of his windows, remember that? And he knelt as he always did before and prayed, right? And remember all the, uh, all the other people that conspired against him? Hey, uh, Darius, didn't you sign this for me? You're saying that no one else should be praying except to you because you're just such a great leader and everyone needs to pay special attention to you. Um, you remember that? So D Daniel, and it's kind of neat when you think about this, because, uh, you know, we know that it took place in the first year of, of Darius. Going to chapter 6 with the lion's den, it seemed good to Darius to a point. So we know that Darius is in there. And then in, in verse 10, as I was just recounting some of this in chapter 6, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house on his roof. Um, he, he prayed. So here, here, what's, what's neat to know, could this... 
praying of chapter nine, ended him up in the lion's den. Did it happen just after? It happened right around that time. Really neat when you think about it. He's praying, he receives this vision, and it's just about the time of the, of the lion's den. Um, so chapter nine, as I mentioned, includes the prayer of Daniel and its answer. Um, so that's the two ways you can divide this chapter. Um, so, um, now let me just say chapter nine, if you, you look at it and you're glancing down, um, chapter nine down to verse 19 um, is, is prayer. Verses one through 19 is prayer. And then verse 20 says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins, my sins. Well, that's, I didn't think Daniel sinned. <laughs> you know, this, he, he, was, he was a great man of God, but wasn't a perfect man of God, right? There's a one perfect man of God, and that is Jesus Christ. Um, but Daniel says, I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Now that, that's, that's interesting there. Um, Daniel associates himself with his people, um, the Jews, right? Um, and, you know, sadly and sometimes gladly, we associate with our country, right? You know, the good times and the bad times. We're still the people of America, right? The people of Russia is going through a really interesting time, you know? Um, some of them would like this war to end, right? But, you know, we're always identified with our country, right? Our people. And um, here, Daniel identifies himself as a sinner. He identifies his people as sinners. And we have to remember there's no perfect country yet, right? That's to come. Um, so, you know, in the sense of my people, Israel, he says, and presenting my supplications before the Lord, uh, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God. So um, there's, there's a flow here um, that Daniel ends verse 27, um, exhausted, sick, he gets up, um, astounded by the vision. Um, he saw the whole sweep of, of Gentile um, world power, world domination. And that took place in the Babylonian reign. And then we come into the reign of the Medes and the Persians. And remember, he's just going to live a short time of this. Um, and he's going to see them come. And he's going to work. Remember I mentioned Darius to you before? And I said, Darius is probably just a title. Remember I said that? This is probably Cyrus. This is probably Cyrus. Um, now, I know it says there's son of Asterus. Um, that is also, that was a very, very, very common name. So we can't even pinpoint from that. Um, could it be uh, someone who was designated as a leader of that area by Cyrus? It could be. Um, but most are going to believe that this is probably Cyrus here in the first year of Cyrus. Um, so in trying to figure out the, the idea, so we just can't do that from history. Um, but he says there of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Now that's the Babylonian area. So as I said, when we talked about Darius before, this could be a, a, a high ranking official um, under Cyrus, representing Cyrus, or it could be of Cyrus himself. Um, so, this, this all happens around the lion's den experience. This happens under the reign of the Medes and the Persians. Um, and there's this king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Um, this is the Chaldeans. Remember, they were the, the native Babylonians. Remember that? Um, so, right there in the heart of where Daniel is. So it says there in the first <clears throat> two, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, 
observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. <coughs> um, and he says there, for completion and desolation of Jerusalem, namely, he says there, 70 years. Now, remember, at the time of the lion's den incident, Daniel is about 80, 85 years old. Remember that? So he's at the tail end of his life. And as he's there and looking at that, sorry, Phyllis. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and but that's you know that's the remarkable guy he was though right and the energy that he had as well i mean there he is and and as he's there what's he doing he's looking at the word of god just like phyllis is doing just like we're doing right he's looking at the word of god and what's he trying to do here He's looking and he's saying, okay, there were 70 years decreed upon this Babylonian captivity. And Daniel's thinking to himself, okay, I was a teenager when I was brought in here. Um, it's about time for us to go home. It's about time, 70 years now is about up. Really neat when you think about it, right? So if he was 15, 16, 17, when he was there, he's 80-some now. So it's, it's about time to get home. And, and what's Daniel doing? He's looking over the books here. Now, um, the dates of the Babylonian captivity um, of when it began, um, 536 to 539 B.C. Daniel's about 80 years old, so... Um, and, and what I think he's trying to do here is just figure out, okay, what Babylonian captivity is it? It was the first deportation, the second or the third. Remember we talked about that at the beginning? Um, so he's, he's being very exact with this as he can and trying to, to look at this. And there in verse 2 it says the books, right? Not just one, but the books. Um, and it says the books, um, let me just read it in, in the context again. And the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed the books, the number of the years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. Now, how many books did Jeremiah write? He wrote Jeremiah and he wrote Lamentations, right? Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet um, because he foresaw these things that would take place. So Daniel has... Two great copies, right? A copy of Jeremiah and a copy of Lamentations. And he's pouring himself over um, the word of God here. Now, let me just pause here and say this. Just because Daniel had visions, just because Daniel could interpret visions, just because God revealed these things very specifically, to Daniel, it never abrogated his responsibility to being a student of the Word of God. Never surpassed that, never replaced that. That's really neat when you think about that, right? I mean, I think if I got these visions, I'd just be stuck with them and, you know, well, who, needs it? who needs anything else? Um, but Daniel realized that the Word of God was was important to putting all these things into perspective and he never stopped studying the word of god i think that's very really unique um especially with how much prophecy and revelation was revealed to him um he was a student of the word um now jeremiah chapter 25 let's just go there for a minute jeremiah chapter 25 This is what I believe Daniel was reading. Moreover, 
I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone, and the light of the lamp. Now Daniel remembers very personally being taken from his country and being brought into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, right? He remembers this and he's reading and pouring over it. I mean, you can just imagine how real this is to Daniel. Then he said, this whole land shall be a desolation and a horror and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How many years? Seventy years. So Daniel's reading and he's praying and he's looking at that passage of scripture. Um, and then also in chapter 29, in chapter 29, um, I just read a little bit here in, in these verses here in chapter 29. Let's, let me see here, just go to... Um, Verse 10, uh, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to the place for I know the plans I have for you. And this leads right into this familiar passage of scripture, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope then you will call upon me and will pray um, to me. And then he says, I will listen to you. I think Daniel took that very personally. I think as Daniel is reading the word of God, he is engaging in prayer and, and really fulfillment of, of this prophecy here by Jeremiah. Um, so it says there that, um, going back to verse 2, of Daniel 9. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed the books, the number of years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion um, of the desolation of Jerusalem. Yeah, it's been completely destroyed, right? Uprooted. Um, namely, he says, 70 years. So, Daniel's there, and he begins to pray. So he says in verse 3, So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with what? Fasting, sackcloth, ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God. Now I see a number of key elements here of prayer. Um, just popping out. As I said that, you know, he's not going to prescribe how to pray. We're getting a glimpse into the prayer life of Daniel. That's what's really neat about this. Uh, chapter 9. We're getting a great glimpse into how Daniel prayed. Number one, he prayed with humility, didn't he? Humility. He prayed with confession. And he, he, he prayed with reverence. Those th three things, humility, um, confession, and reverence. As he says, alas, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, um, extolling God, if you would. Um, now, let me just say this. Prayer should always be a response to the Word of God. The Word of God and prayer go hand in hand, or should go hand in hand. Um, you know, as, as you would read that and you looked at the passage of Jeremiah, most people would just close up the book then and say, well, praise God, thank you, God. Um, 70 years is coming to an end. I'm just gonna wait here for you to get me out of here and be done, right? I mean, honestly, that's how most people would respond to that. Um, hey, man, all right, I'm gonna, just going to trust you, God. Good. Um, but he engaged with that information. He's engaging in the Word of God with prayer. Now, um, 
unless <laughs> unless we understand the word of God, we don't understand the plans and the purposes of God, do we? Like some people look at world events, they, they're clueless. They just think these things happen randomly, right? We look at world events and say, no, these things are are setting up for the end times. We might not be able to explain it all, but just look at the big pictures of this, right? Don't get caught up in the nitty gritty. Just look at the big pictures of what's happening. Look at the big picture, um, the Jews returning to Israel in our generation. Look at the big picture now uh, of the revived Roman Empire beginning to shape, take shape. You know, we can look at big pictures. And um, when we do that, we know that God's plan is unfolding, right? It's unfolding. Um, and when Daniel saw that the plan of God was beginning to unfold, it drove him to prayer. It drove him to prayer. So he's reading the word of God. And as he's reading the word of God, the response from reading the word of God um, brought prayer. Um, now, do we always understand what God's doing in our life? No. Do we understand what God's going to do with Putin right now? No, we don't. We know what we would like to do with Putin right now, but we don't know what God's going to do with Putin right now, right? We, we don't know. Um, we don't understand the relationship of God's sovereignty and free will all the time, right? But we know that God's sovereign. We don't always understand the doctrine of election, right? Um, and the doctrine of, of um, how God uses that, and yet someone still makes a choice. But here's the thing. Um, it's not for me to always understand all the details of those things. Amen? If we understood all the details of those things, we would be God, <laughs> you know? Daniel knows 70 years coming to a completion. He doesn't understand yet all the implications, how this is going to happen. Um, you know, it doesn't look like it's happening. Daniel's reading the book saying, oh no, here's the Medes and the Persians. Here we go again, right? He doesn't know that Cyrus is going to issue a decree they can go home. Never saw that come. You know, to see how that all unfolds. So we don't always know the details of life, but here's the thing. We do know the plans of God for our life and for the world. Amen? And our prayers need to coincide with the word of God, even with things we don't understand in our own life. We don't just shut it up and say, okay, 70 years, okay, good. Uh, you know, and, and some people look at the Bible verse and say, you know, man's going to live 70 years. Okay, 70 years. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> right? You know, we don't always understand the details, Right? Don't always understand the details, but prayer, prayer is this. Um, you, you know, how can I say this? Um, even though it's not for us to understand, Daniel went immediately to the Lord. Notice how he does it. Supplication, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Um, you know, he's basically saying, um, Lord, um, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm setting my face before you to agree completely with what you're going to do in the, my life and the life of my people according to what you said. And he begins to pray this prayer. And he's really going to um, be saying to God, let me just show you. Verse 19. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen. Take action. You know what he's saying? Just do it, God. Just do it. Your word is sovereign. Your word's going to be accomplished. Let it be. Um, and and that's, that's, that's a really neat way to look at it. Um, Psalm 119, let's just go there for a minute. I said these parallel different things. Psalm 119 begins, O oh God, my praise, do not be silent. 
And then verse 24, though, is what I want to show you there in Psalm 119. My knees are weak from fasting. My flesh has grown lean with fatness. I also become a reproach. Oh, I'm not even Psalm 119. I'm on 109. All right. All right. I get there. Give me a second. I don't go up that high in my Bible. No. It begins like this in verse 9. Verse 1. How blessed, how blessed are the ways of those who is blameless, who walk in the laws of the Lord. And then down to verse 24. It says there, Your testimonies are my delight. Testimonies, what's that? The word of God, right? The, the, the precepts of God. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my what? Counselor, yes. Um, so he's basically saying, you know, your word counsels me. And that's what Daniel was receiving when he <laughs> set his face to prayer. He was receiving counsel from Jeremiah, the prophet, in, under inspiration of the writings. Um, and then in verse 99, anyone still in that chapter there? I'm not. Anybody want to read verse 99? I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Oh, yeah. What's he doing meditating on it, right? Mm -hmm. Have a problem in life? Go to the Word and meditate on it with prayer, right? Um, and then, <laughs> here's something. Look at John. Look what he did in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Um, And in verse 20, how it ends. Just, just think of how this ends for a minute. It almost <coughs> sounds flat when you think about it. He who testifies to these things say, says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Then he says, Amen. And what does he do? He just echoes what the Lord said, come, Lord Jesus. He's saying, look, fulfill your plans. This is exactly what Daniel's praying. He's looking at things. He's looking at his own life in captivity. He's looking at the 70 years being coming to a completion. And he's praying in accordance with the word of God. You know where we get into trouble in our prayers? when we don't pray according to the word of God. Then we start stretching prayers in areas where they don't belong. Think about it. It's true, isn't it? And so it's a point of identification with the plans and the purpose of God. Remember this, prayer is not for God. My prayers don't give power to God. When we pray collectively, we don't give him more power. It's not like power draining out of us, going into God. No, it's not like that at all. Prayer is the purpose of it, is that we align ourselves to the plans and the purpose of the word of God. And we set our hearts right with that. Right? That's what prayer is. Where we can come and say, God... You have a plan, you have a purpose for my life, and I believe you're gonna fulfill it because your word says it, right? So that's, that's what it is, and that's how Daniel's praying. Um, and it, just go back to Daniel chapter nine, and I wrap up here and just reading here just a couple more verses. Um, so he says in verse three, so I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer. Why? After reading the word, right? He says in verse four, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, now we know from on, on in this prayer, he confesses his own sins. He confesses the sins of his own people. Now, it's easy for us as Christians to point our fingers at the world, right? And say, look how sinful you are. Look how bad you are. Look how stupid you are, right? 
sometimes we don't realize that we should also be praying for ourselves, right? I'm serious, that we are just sometimes as ornery as the world, right? And that's, that's how Daniel's praying this. Even though he's probably the godliest man in the Old Testament, right? Um, and yet he's confessing his sins along with the sins of his people. Um, and, you know, I pray to the Lord my God, confess and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenants, love and kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. He says, you're the covenant keeper. You know, we get to love you and watch you do this. He says, we have sinned. We, we've committed iniquity. We've acted wickedly. You know what? I, in America, there's a lot of aborted babies. A lot of, you know what? That's not just their sins. You know, it's easy to think that. That's their sins. That's the mother's sin. That's our government's sin. That is our sin. This is our people. That sin's on us, right? All the sins of, of America are on us as well. And Daniel prays this way. We have sinned. We've committed iniquity, acted wickedly, rebelled, even in turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants of the prophets. We can go to look at our country. We're to blame that the Bible got kicked out of school, right? You know, we're at fault for these things. Um, we just can't look at this world in America and say, this is all your fault. It's all of our fault. We are the people of America, right? Um, and how did, how, you might say, well, how did it happen? Well, apparently we didn't teach the younger generation right, right? Apparently we haven't passed the torch. And I'm talking for, for generations now in our country. This just didn't happen all of a sudden. We just didn't wake up one day and, and, and get here with a new day, did we? This was a combination of things that have led to this. And we all have part, we all have blame for that. And that's what should drive us to prayer, right? and confession. We are guilty of this. It's so easy, isn't it? From the pulpit or from our lives or whatever to point at other people. But we're, we're culprits as well. We've sinned. We've committed iniquity. Acted wickedly. Rebelled. Did you ever rebel? Did you ever act wickedly? Then we're part of the problem of where we got to, right? That's what he's saying here. Even turning aside from your commitment. Ever do that? Yeah, we have. And your ordinance, have you done it? Yes. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our prince. And that's the story he said that. I think he's thinking of his own people and, and the, the kings of, of, of Israel and Judah. Remember, we looked at them, all the bad kings and all that. And then also thinking, here we are again. You know, um, there's the Babylonian king. Well, just maybe as bad as our kings were, right? Um, so he looks, at all, he looks at all of this. Our princes, our fathers. And then he, he looks internally there. And all the people of the land. And then it says, righteousness belongs to you. Right? Um, so, all right, that's kind of chapter 9. Um, that's kind of where we're going with it. An important verse is, is um, probably when he begins to pray and, and those verses there. Um, what does it teach us about Christ? And this prayer is going to model after the, the prayer of our Lord. Um, command to obey, um, read God's word, and pray, right? And it's kind of neat to do it in that order. Sometimes we might pray then, read God's word, you can do that. But it's neat to, after you're reading God's word, to pray, to think, how can this fit in to my life? So, um, all right, let's do that right now. Let's pray. Father, you've revealed so much stuff to your prophet Daniel, um, so much stuff for us to absorb. And we're amazed at how you know the future because you are already there, your plans and your sovereignty accomplish each step to get us there. 
And Lord, we know that once we receive this information, we have it, and we know the things of this world, Lord, it should drive us to prayer. It should drive us to pray. As we see events unfolding before our eyes, history in the making right now, this is, this is exciting times, troubling times, heartbreaking times, but also, Lord, knowing that um, out of that United States of Europe, out of that revived Roman Empire, there's going to be an Antiochus Epiphanes that comes back, the final Antichrist. And it's not going to be out of Russia. It's going to be one of, what we might say, one of our own, the beast. And he had turned against religion, true religion, and he would try to stomp it out. And we will be the bad ones. We will be the hated ones of the world. We will be the ones that, um, and the tribulation saints, that they cut off from the markets. They, they cut off the buying and selling power off. They, they, they will be the sanctioned ones. And Lord, just because we name the name of Jesus Christ and we stand for what your righteousness, even though we're not righteous in and of ourselves, our righteousness only comes from you. Help us, dear God, to pray for our world, to pray for our country. We pray that you give our president right now wisdom. Lord, we are, and many have warned that we could be on the brink of a nuclear missile. I don't believe the end of the world because that's still Armageddon. But we do know that the Antichrist could arise from this. He could be born right now. He could be empowered now even. He's going to bring the world back together. It will be a false peace. But Lord, we're in the midst of these wars and rumors of wars. We pray for the Ukrainians. We pray for Christians. We pray, for, um, I've been reading some things about Christian outreaches that are happening now and ways that we can be involved in and, and helping the U Ukrainian refugees. And as we've been thinking as a church, what we're doing at Christmas time or something, this could be something really neat. And um, I pray that you just give us a, a clear vision of that, dear God. And we pray that you help each of the soldiers there, of the Ukrainians. We pray that you keep Zelensky alive, his government intact. Um, they just want to be free, and we pray for their freedom. We, I, I, I don't think it's possible at all for them to defeat Russia. But I pray, I pray you give them resilience. In Jesus' name, amen.